Slow Dazzle Worldwide is proud to present a series of interviews under the title The Secrets of Doctor Who. On this cassette, we feature an interview recorded with Elizabeth Sladen, who played Sarah Jane Smith, companion to John Pertwee and Tom Baker. Welcome to our fabulous studios here in sunny Shepherd's Bush. Um, I just reply to that. That's lovely. <laughs> I'm very impressed and I'm very, very pleased to be seen by you. Thank you. <laughs> um, the idea of, of, the, of the interview, obviously, is the secrets of Doctor Who. Right. So why don't we start with how you got the job? Well, I don't know how secret this is because I have let it slip a few times at conventions. But you might know that the BBC, they never advertise that they will need a new companion. So when I was approached to go up for a job in Doctor Who, I thought that's what it was. A story, maybe one episode. And I went up and I saw Barry Letts at Threshold House. And I recognised Barry, he used to be an actor. And he was very, very kind to me. He put me at my ease. And he took a lot of time and usually you're in and out of interviews, like a dose of salts. Mm. And I read some of the script. He read it with me. He seemed very pleased. And he said, I tell you what, he said, John Pertwee is rehearsing at North Acton. Would you like to come and meet him? And also, I will phone up another actor to do the scene that I've been doing with you, and then I can watch. So I thought, my God, they are thorough on Doctor Who, you know. <laughs> so I tootled along with Barry to North Acton. I did the scene with this other actor, who in the event turned up as the baddie in um, one of the radio stories, Stephen Thorne. Right. Uh, and um, John came down. And my first impression of John, John was a very, um, you could not not notice him, this shock of white hair. And he had on, as I remember, a denim jacket. And it was absolutely, at that time, it was terribly fashionable to be covered in badges, all sparkling. Mm -hmm. And I think he had a girl on either arm. I later realized that because he was nervous, it was the PA and the AFM. And he came in and he had a chat to me. And the story goes that, according to John and Barry, that while John was looking at me, Barry was going around behind me. And where I couldn't see him, he was putting his thumb in the air, sort of going, OK, she's read OK. Do you like the look of her? Do you think it'll match your doctor? And then John evidently went behind me. Barry came in front and spoke to me. And John put his thumb up above my head and said, well, she looks all right. She's all right with you, mate. She's all right with me. <laughs> And then he said goodbye, and Barry offered me the job on the spot. And I, I was totally overwhelmed. Were there, were there other actresses um, that were considered before you? Oh, surely, yes. Uh, as I recall, I had done recently um, a Z cars for Ron Craddock. I had done two Z cars in, 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 I think, four months, which is very unusual. One girl was a very timid uh, girl, and the other girl was a real Liverpool scrubber. And the story goes that they were shouting down the corridors. It was getting near, you know, time when they were going to have to have someone. You know, do you know an actress, anyone? And Ron Craddock kindly suggested me. But I did hear that someone else had been approached and signed for the role. And not hedging my bets, I truly don't know who that was. But physically, she was not like me. I'm, I'm quite petite. And you know, she was built differently. And you have to remember, I think all the doctors, but John's doctor in particular, he was the gentleman doctor, mm -hmm. with the cape, putting the cape around the little chick in a protective way. And it's very difficult to be protective if someone is rather large. It, it, it doesn't have to be, but it doesn't look correct. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I got the job on the rebound, actually, from someone else. How did you feel? Because obviously at the point where you came in, Katie Manning had left. Mm. A lot of the production team seemed to be breaking up, and then John Pertwee himself announced he was going. Well, initially, I didn't know that. Um, I went down for my first day of filming, and John kept calling me Katie. It was terribly embarrassing. <laughs> embarrassing for me, embarrassing for him. And I, I realised how important Katie had been and how popular she was with the fans, with the general public. And it, it's quite, believe me, it's quite a pressure on your shoulders coming into a show of long-standing and of popularity to try and sort of take over. You make the role your own, but you really are stepping into someone else's shoes. I mean, John couldn't have been kinder, but it was awful, actually, because on my very first scene, he got his walking stick out and he, he poked it in the ground. He sat on it and folded his arms in, in a nice gesture. Right, I'm going to watch you. And I thought, oh, please don't watch me. Please go away. I want to do this on my own. 
Did you feel as though uh, you walked in at the end of the party? Not initially, no. But I, I, unit were not going to be in it as much. And then after the first one, I realised that John was actually going to leave. He had always planned to before I came into it at the end of, um, at the end of this set of six um, stories or whatever. And it was always sort of in the background, but it was very much in the background until the very last one. And then John did something that he needed to do himself. He needed to distance himself physically. We actually became very close. We had a very good working relationship, a very funny one, very humorous. And towards the end, he distanced himself from me physically. Really? He would bring his, um, something he'd never done before, he would bring his mail in and photographs to sign in the rehearsal room when he wasn't needed. And he set up a little office right at the far end, and he sat and he, he needed to do that for himself. It was very sad, really, because then I, I sort of just would let him do that until he wanted to come back to me again, but he had to do that. With the, the choice of the new doctor, who ultimately ended up being Tom Baker, mm -hmm. there were other people tossed around. Oh, yes. Barry kept coming in and saying, now we're going to, our, uh, now who did I hear? Uh, Jim Dale, Ron Moody. I, I since met Ron Moody and he said, oh, I was an idiot not to do it, not to do it. Ron Moody, um, Graham Horton, Howden, Graham Horton. Crowden. Crowden, thank you. Um, and there were some others, I think, but those are the only three I actually Isn't remember. Mr. Pastry, the chap who played, was... Oh, I don't know. Maybe. I don't I remember his name. Richard or Hearn. Richard Hearn. I don't know. And then obviously Tom got the part. Mm. And also a big guy. Mm. Were you worried about working with him? Well, they always had to put me in very high heel boots, which was terrible to run in. So whenever I, my feet, I said, are the feet in shot? No, I used to change in my pumps. <laughs> I used to then, I could run faster. Uh, and Tom was the devil because he hated combing his hair. The makeup people used to chase him. Where's he gone? With a comb. And he said, no, I'm a doctor. I'm saving the universe. I haven't got time to comb my hair. <laughs> and of course, his hat would shadow me sometimes. Yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, you had to make sure he knew where your light was. Was he, do you think he was worried about taking over the mantle from such a successful doctor? Oh, I'm sure he was. As a professional actor, he must have been. Um, the last story I did with John was The Spiders. And I don't think, we didn't film the last scene as the last one. Sometimes you don't go in order to accommodate the sets in the studio space. And I remember the day we, we filmed John's um, leaving of the character and Tom's face superimposed on. And John had been having a great deal of trouble with his back. Uh, there was that, he was in pain. Also, it was a very tense moment. I was meant to, as Sarah, be crying and upset because I thought the doctor was dead. Plus the fact that Tom was walking into the set in the clothes to meet John and myself for the first time. And it was bristling. It wasn't the time to say, hello, how do you do? I'm Lou. You know, and be terribly, mm -hmm. whatever. It was, you just actually got on with it. It was very terse. Very, everyone was concentrating in their own little area. Tom did it, that, and went. And he went down to film Robot. I finished the, the studio with John, and then I would go down in the car that night, uh, about 11 o'clock, do some filming with John, who'd found a great buddy in, um, with Tom rather, who'd found a great buddy in Ian Martyr, when I felt quite out of it. And then I would shoot back to do some more filming with John, and then eventually I, I joined them. And so it was quite so natural slide in, in, in with, mm. with Tom from John, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, for the viewer, there was I don't know, six months between the two, I suppose. I can't remember. I can't remember how long the gap was. I don't remember either, but there was obviously a gap. So, so for the viewer, it was more of a wrench. Goodbye, John. Mm. Anticipation, anticipation, hello, Tom. But for you, you, it was just from one to the other. Well, yes, from one to the other, but you, you, you think, you know, it's a whole new ball game. The goalposts are totally moved. You have a totally different doctor. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gosh, I do hope this works as well. And heavens to Betsy, it worked beautifully. Yeah. Beautifully. Whether because, I mean, Tom is, is very approachable. I mean, he's lovely. Also, he's from Liverpool, I'm from Liverpool. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a similar sense of humour. He made me laugh a great deal. And I was so lucky as the character because I had had John's doctor. You see, the companion doesn't make the running, nor must she you bounce off what the doctor gives you. Mm -hmm. So I had John's doctor, and I had that Sarah, and then I move on to Tom, who's totally different, and gives me different things for my Sarah to react to. So Sarah actually had a chance to grow, or to, to enlarge. 
Which doctor did you prefer? That is unanswerable. <laughs> it is, I have been asked it so many times. If I look at my time with John, my time with Tom, one could not do without the other. Sarah would not be the same. I'm just so lucky to have had both of them, mm -hmm. really. Probably the two and, most And a different successful. approach, a different approach to both of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As Tom Baker's series got underway, there were lots of terrific stories. Yes, they moved us into space more, didn't they? Yes, and it was goodbye to unit, mm. for the most part. To some degree. Do you have favourite stories? I loved Planet of Evil because for the first time I worked at Elon Studios, which has this great, wonderful background, all the people who've worked there. Also, I was landing in a beautiful place, not on some rubbish dump or <laughs> sand heap or tip or anything. That was nice. And also, I remember, I don't think David Maloney thinks that I heard, but um, I was in quite, um, not boyish gear, but um, not terribly feminine. And he said, oh, for God's sake, he said, get her something frilly. Let, let her look like a girl a bit. And I had this nice little sort of bustier on and a blouse and short little um, trousers. And also, you see, that was at a time when I realised how popular we were. It kind of, all of a sudden you've got a character that you don't really have to work at, it just comes. You sort of reach a plateau and you think, oh, I can dare to be brave with this. I don't have to fight for this anymore. I know what she'd do. And Philip Hinchcliffe called us into the office one day and he was nearly dancing on the desk. He's going, 18 million! 18 million! And, it, I mean, it was just fantastic. It was a wonderful feeling. Very rarely, very rarely do you get that. I mean, <clears throat> they seem to, during that period, look at classic horror genres like Jekyll and Hyde. Well, there are no new stories. No, there are, really. there are. But they did it so well, didn't yes, they? Yes, they did. Because Robot was like King Kong, really, wasn't it? Yes, very much. And I suppose Planet of Evil was... Um, uh, Robbie the Robot. Jekyll and Hyde. And, it was... Pl it was um, Forbidden one, Planet. Yes, yes. And Francis. And um, Pyramids of Mars was all those hammer mummy mm. movies. But they worked so well, Well, we they? had wonderful writers. We had Bob Holmes, you know, Gothic period. I mean, yeah, very, very lucky. Do you have a <laughs> favourite monster? Well, I'd, you see, John hated the Daleks, and I'm not sure about Tom, he might have done as well. But I always saw the little people inside, I mean, I, they, they were so conscientious. Sidetown, John Scott Martin, um, uh, Mur Murphy Grumbar, they didn't have to learn the lines. You know, they, they'd be paddling around at rehearsal in the bottom half, <laughs> and they would learn everything so that they could plunge their little plunger and beep their little light. And they were just so wonderful. And the Daleks used to make me laugh as well. I remember going filming with John uh, for the Exelon story. And we were, we were on this beach, sand dunes. And of course, Daleks can't move on sand. So they put this railway track around them. And we were being chased by them. And all of a sudden, a Dalek would turn the corner and not be able to turn, go whee, <laughs> and fall over right on the side in the sand. It was, it, was, it was a very funny one, that, for monsters as well, the Exelons, with, with the wonderful stuntmen inside them to make them move well, because you must have good mm -hmm. movement inside a monster to make them live. And they would be coming up the sand dunes, and they were in this sort of tent affair, and as they were walking up, they were walking further and further on their frock, so that their feet were just up to their head in the air, <laughs> and they couldn't move, they couldn't get up from the floor. What about, I mean, talking about movement, mm. I can't help thinking about the Ice Warriors and that lumbering gait. Oh, yes, I, I only met an Ice Warrior once and he was enormous. Uh, he, I, he was a black actor, is a black actor, I can't remember his name. And it, we, we, he was a really nice bloke. And I heard him along the corridor behind me when he was chasing me going, <gasps> and he was having, he really was having trouble breathing. And I thought, well, he's not going to stop, but he's going to feel terrible, I'm going to stop. And I really got shouted at, but what had happened, they hadn't put any breathing holes in for him. Oh he was all fogged up inside. <laughs> I took the head off and going, <gasps> absolutely flat out <laughs> in the tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. I believe I mean, there's a lovely, um, I don't know who's got the tape now of a, a dinosaur one, but there was this small little hole I had to creep through, and I had to sort of wriggle. So there was only sort of my bottom to camera, and they kept me wriggling for ages. <laughs> And I, being a true professional, I thought, well, I'd better go till they say cut. And after they said, oh, someone's going to enjoy that tape. <laughs> I 
I've read somewhere that the TARDIS fell on you. Oh, the roof. <laughs> yes, I got inside it and all of a sudden it plopped on me. And they painted it the wrong colour once. That were, it came out to us and we looked and we thought, hello, that's the wrong colour. And I think the door went on the wrong way once, so it's meant to open inwards. So three of us, Ian, Tom and I, went flat into it with our noses, bump, bump, three of us on it, because it was opening outwards. And it's very small inside as well. Oh, gosh, shattering a few illusions there. Oh, oh, what have I said, Mother? <laughs> <laughs> when you decided to leave... Yes. Um, that must have been very difficult. It was such a successful show. It was almost because it was a successful show, and, and, and Sarah was popular, and she was mine. And Barry, who chose me, had left. He'd left the position of producer, and Philip Hinchcliffe had come along, and he'd been terribly appreciative of what I did, and I got on very well with him. But I knew... I knew there would come a time when Philip would want to choose his own companion and I knew he would have these ideas and I kind of sort of paced it and I thought it's really, I stayed quite a while with, with Tom and Philip and I thought I don't want to be asked to leave, I would hate that, I would love to be really awkward almost and go on my terms and go while it's at a high mm -hmm. and I had nothing to go to. Um, I, 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 did, I, I did a job not long afterwards at um, some plays back in Liverpool at the Rep. But I just knew that I, for me I had to go then and I thought, well, I, I can't, I've done this. I've done it as honestly as I can. I've really, I can, I can justify every thought she's had. You know, even if she's fallen down a hole 50 times, mm -hmm. she would do that for her best friend to mm -hmm. save him. You would do that to help mm -hmm. your best I didn't mind being made to look a fool because it was done with the right reasons and it was never... Um, and, and Tom was wonderful. He said, look, that makes Liz look stupid. I would never have someone stupid going around with me. I am the doctor. So you had a wonderful, you know, backup. And I just thought, well, you know, I really had enough. And I, I asked to go. And I don't think I was really, really persuaded to stay. Tom was very sorry, I think. And I thought, yes, it is the right time. Um, does, that, does that make you feel a bit bad, the fact that they didn't get down and bended and said, no, 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 you must stay, you must stay? No, no, I think they, 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 they sort of asked. No, no, it didn't actually. It didn't, because I think we're all being very honest. Um, no, no. So your, your final scenes of mm. your last story, which was The Hand of Fear, mm. which were great. Directed by lovely Lenny Main. Oh, he was And you, you and Tom wrote those, didn't you? Or, or added extra lines into those? What we did was, um, the writers took on board that I didn't want to be killed off. I didn't really think that was fair on younger viewers, and I certainly didn't want to be married off. And I said, I, when I'm viewing something as a viewer, I love to be taken by surprise. Please, let's have a really good Doctor Who story, nothing about the, um, the companion leaving. And then just at the end, twist it and say, oh, I'm sick of being shit at and shut up, I've had it, I want to go. And um, the scene was accommodated and it, it, we read it and we were allowed to, to tamper with it quite a little bit and put lines in and yeah, I believe it works. So have you watched I, it since? Well, yes I have, not, not initially because I, I was working and didn't have a video recorder, I only saw it really years later. It was quite strange, it was rather like watching um, a cousin he once knew very well. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I overacted rather much but um, basically I was quite pleased. Why didn't you want it to be married off? Oh, that's not what it's about. You can't have any sort of sex in the TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with that. No, no. I, and, and also, you see, that's what had happened to Katie. Oh, there you go. And okay. I didn't really think it worked. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That's just my personal mm -hmm. view. So you left the show, mm. but you, you came back and you did Canine and Company. Yes, I did. I did, didn't I? Was that supposedly going to be a series? Oh, yes. Hopefully it would have been. Um, Nathan Turner, I have to thank forever to actually manage to get a companion to carry something. Um, I was working on Gulliver and Lilliput at the time, and it was a quick swap over for me to K9. I got the script for K9, and things for me didn't work in it. Um, they weren't like Sarah. So I went to see John, and I went to see um, Eric Seward, script editor, writer. And I voiced my, 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 my opinions, and I always said, well, well, yes, there'll be plenty of time. They had a load of time to film. It was all going to be done on film. But, and what happened was we had a load of time taken away from us, and those things were never, ever ironed out. Um, I don't know how we ever did it in the end. I mean, the, the actual 
opening shots I knew nothing about until I turned up at filming and they said, right now, I mean, one looked like a sort of heart to heart drinking a glass of wine. I said, what am I supposed to be doing? And I was giving a costume. Now you're meant to be juggling. I thought, I don't know what I'm doing here. I mean, it, you had to do it because it was there. It was in the script. Well, I'll just do it as best I can. Uh, we had appalling weather. I remember at one point being directed by the cameraman. Now run here, run there, up there, down there. I, I mean, while someone, you know, the director was somewhere else. It, it really was like, you know, way back in the old Hollywood time, I guess. Uh, and at one point, it was about two in the morning, and I think that Brendan, the character, he was being supposedly sacrificed. And all the, um, the tribe of um, sources, whatever, were going around shouting, Hecate, Hecate. You know, about two in the morning, they were all shouting, Equity, Equity, <laughs> Equity. It was um, quite fraught, actually. But, you know, all, you know, good to John, he actually got it done. And then I did hear um, that the powers that be that had um, commissioned it changed. New people came in, didn't want it. Really? Was well, it we successful? Had, well, the night that it was aired, I think all Liverpool and up north area, the, the, the pylons were down. Hardly anyone got that. I mean, we, we did not have a very good first showing. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's like anything. You see, time is money now. And, you know, unless you make an initial wonderful entrance, then you must have time to work on it. Something like The Good Life. It's in its second series before you think, oh, I quite like this. And yes. you, you, you know, you're given no time, but at the same time, something has either got to work, someone's got to make a decision, yay or nay, and ours went down. I'm sorry about that, really. Even Dad's Army, apparently, when it was first shown, it was axed. Really? I heard a story that John, John P, was asked to do the main way. No. the mannering part. Yes, he actually told me himself. And he was over in America at the time. Mm. That would have been interesting, wouldn't it? Mm. Hmm. Whether he was just up for it along with many, or whether it was actually offered on, I don't know now. But you maintained a relationship with Doctor Who through mm. to the five Doctors, mm -hmm. and uh, and obviously um, uh, the, the radio plays. Well, the five Doctors, it, one couldn't turn it down. It was rather like a Royal Command performance walk down. Everyone <laughs> did it. How they accommodated everyone with the Doctors. Uh, that poor director, Peter Moffat. Will you stop talking, stop chatting and come to the scene? <laughs> You'd, you'd meet someone you hadn't met for a long time. I mean, it was amazing it got done. Again, not enough time at all. Last minute. Mm -hmm. uh, radio is wonderful. I mean, who? I mean, that we never thought of it before. That no one ever thought of it before. Uh, I was just approached by my agent. Would I be a Sarah Jane? I said, no, I'm not just going in to be made fun of and scream. I thought it was just one of those little things. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do that to the character. And she said, no, Barry Letts is writing. I said, fine. I don't have to see a script. I'll do it, whatever. And then it all progressed and we were doing... And it was just like going back to school after the initial kind of hello and Nick and John and I. And even my voice changed. I thought maybe my voice will sound too old now. But it just kind of came. Oh, we had great fun and wonderful director, Phil Clark. And of course, Barry was there. You need to know anything about Do Doctor Who, you ask Barry Letts. Mm -hmm. He would say, Barry, what? He would have the answer. Um, it was great fun. It went to number one immediately, the first radio. We then didn't touch it for a year, which I still don't it's know ridiculous, why. ridiculous, isn't it? Well, whatever the reasons be, it defeats me to find one. We then did uh, six episodes of a new story, um, Ghosts of End Space, and um, that was kept on the shelf for about 18 months. When it was released, what did it do? Straight to number one. Unbelievable. Very strange, isn't it? Yes, if you want a new audience, surely you put things out like they did the Tintin series. Wham, 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 one mm -hmm. after the other. You've got a whole new audience. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. I heard that on, a, on one of these conventions, you and John were thrown out of a hotel? <laughs> we did a tour. Ah! We did a tour across the States in the um, early 80s. We went from Tampa, Ch Chapel Hill, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, on to Denver. Well, somewhere in Philadelphia, there's a wonderful performance of John and I falling out of the TARDIS. We were actually going to be thrown out of our hotel room because the guy taking us round, we were with our respective spouses, hadn't paid. He was paying as we were sort of going on. And um, the baggage, my husband was waiting with the baggage on the ground and John's lovely wife Ingeborg was running down to the theatre and said, John, John, we're going to be thrown out of the hotel. And John thought she had had an accident. She said, now sit down Ingeborg, sit down. And he gave her a little calming pill, which was followed down by a vodka. We thought it was water. The same was there for me. I don't know what John gave me, but just all of a sudden we were called to the TARDIS. And I said, well, where's, where's Brian? What, 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 where, where, where are my clothes? And he said, now calm down, let's take this, drink that, drink that, take that. I remember nothing more. <laughs> I remember nothing more. So I woke up in my bed the next morning in a rather nice hotel in Philadelphia. 
but I, someone actually wrote to me and said I gave a wonderful performance. <laughs> but I don't know. I've yet to see it. Are there any regrets about your time in Doctor Who? Oh, I've never been asked that before. Um, oh, yes, I do. I have one enormous regret. I was never tied to the railway lines, <laughs> like Fay Ray. I would have loved that. That would have been, I never thought of that when I was leaving. Yes, I would have liked that. Mrs. Slayton, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, thank you. <laughs>